Okay. And this thing works. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, my uh, topic really had nothing to do with uh, deformities, but uh, somebody put the topic on. Uh, I want to talk about the split cord malformations. And I suppose a number of these patients will have some deformities that require fixing, but, the, but I won't be talking about that. I'm talking about the split cord itself. So anyway, um, as you know, split cord malformation is a malformation of gastrulation, which is the absolute most primitive, earliest stage of development of the spinal cord and the spine itself. It's before primary neurulation, it's before secondary neurulation. So it changes is so early that I want to um, take you embryologically because a lot of these variants are predictable from the embryology if you have some glimpse of the knowledge of it. Anyway, uh, there are two types just to, just to get it straight. Type 1 is what's in the old days called diastamina myelia. We don't use that term anymore. And what it is is that it has a bone spike in the middle and two dural sacs. And the type 2 would be a single dural sac with no obvious bone spike in the middle, but there, as you will see, there are other elements of tethering of the hemicords itself. Now, um, gastrulation is when the embryo starts it off as a bilaminar, meaning the epiblast and the hypoblast, you can see from that one, and it changes into a three-level embryo, which of course consists of the exoderm, mesoderm, endoderm type embryo. And during that process, you can see the epiblastic cells on the side which slide it to the midline through a structure called a primitive streak. And what it does is that it goes inside and it starts replacing tissues from, the, from deeper layers and form three levels. First of all, the inner layer, which is the deepest layer facing the, the yolk sac, is the endoderm. Middle one, of course, mesoderm, and the most superficial layer, the epiblastic cells are now replacing the old ones and make into a new layer called the ectoderm. So now you've got three layers here. Now, during this formation, this gastrulation bit, there's one other process which is important to what we're talking about, and that is that Henson's note, which, which is here, um, there are cells that are changing. For example, there are these prospective notochord cells coming from Henson's note's tip, and it goes through a midline hole called the primitive pit, and it goes inside and it forms the back end of what we now know, know as the notochord. So now you see a bunch of notochordal um, cells going from, from the bottom up, pushing the old cells in the notochord forward. So the notochord actually increases by adding new cells in the back end going forward. Now here comes the interesting part in the basic model of split cord malformation, all split cord malformations, and that is that during the sliding on the two, two sides on the Henson's node, you can see the arrow cells coming down. They have to come down from one, one group from the left, one from the right, and they integrate in the middle. And the integra after integration, midline integration, which is a very common embryologic mechanism by adhesion molecules and so on, once they integrate in the middle, it forms a midline single structure. Now, during the midline integration, if there is a problem with integration process, in that particular junction, the two sides, the left and right, cannot fuse in the middle and therefore leaves a gap in the middle. And that gap is, therefore, when the original ectoderm is still stuck to the endoderm without that middle, middle sort of, sort of uh, structure layer of notochordal cells. What happens is that that adhesion point between ectoderm and endoderm becomes something that divides the neuroplate and the embryo into two parts, left and right. And they can no longer, at that junction, come together to form a single structure now. So what happens is that your initial notochord, which should be a single one in the midline, becomes two heminotochord, as you can see here. The heminotochord then are two things on each side of this midline adhesion point, and then each of the heminotochord then induces the neuroplate on top into a hemineuroplate, so now forms two hemichords related to each of its own heminotochord, and there it is. 
Now, after formation of the hemichords, slightly later, you will have other cells creeping into the midline septum. And these are, first of all, the mesenchyme cells, which are sort of everywhere in your embryo. And as you know, the mesenchyme cells can form mesodermal elements, can form fibrous structure, blood vessels, cartilage bone, any of them. After that, the last stage is when another group of cells come. These are normal embryologic cells called the Mellings primitiva cells, which basically are primitive meningeal cells that ultimately form meninges that normally form around as a single tube around the single neural tube. In this case, of course, it is now split into two groups. So if that is the basic model, sorry, if that is the basic model, then how can that develop into the clinical entities that we see, all the variants we see in split cord malformation in children all the time? Now, this is, we actually try to duplicate, see if our, M, our, our mechanism worked and we made a split, and these are the African, African claw frogs that we did. We made a model and we made a slit, as you can see here, at the time of gastrulation, like, like so. And ultimately, as you can see, this is our proposed model in 92. This is the model that we developed in 98. And you can see how incredibly analogous there's the hemicord, 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 hemicord in the frog. That midline structure, the midline tract is what we call the endomesenchymal tract, which is the original ectoderm, endoderm adhesions. And also, you can see that the gut, which is the yolk sac, is ventral to the, and is attached to one end of that endomesenchymal tract, just like in the frog, just like in our model. So now let's see what happens. What are the later stages that would become what we know clinically in the patient? First of all, there are three main conditions that you will see that basic model will fulfill in the, to become what we know. The first one is the developmental phase of all the elements within the endomesenchymal tract. Remember, the endomesenchymal tract had ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and Mellings primitive cells. Okay, so now what happens to these things? Now we know that the Mellings cells, the, Mellings, the primitive meningeal cells, ultimately de decide whether this is going to be a type one and type two. Here is how. Now look at this, look at the timing. The Mellings cells appear at day 29 after fertilization. On the other hand, the beginning of growth of gastrulation, meaning the primary neural tube, begins at day 18. So there's a discrepancy in dates. So the, your spinal cord starts developing earlier than the appearance of the Mellings cells, which is the last stage. So the Mellings cells develop afterwards. Now, what if, what if it depends on how late developing of that gastrulation and that endomesenchymal tract is, how late closer to the beginning and appearance of the Mellings cells will determine what kind of structures you have. For example, let's look at type one. Type one, you can see lower one has got a bone spike in the middle and two completely separate meningeal coverings on, on the hemichords surrounding the amicord. Now, it's interesting that the type 1 cords, are, type 1 split cords are almost always in the lumbar region and lower thoracic region and at the most in the upper mid thoracic region. I have never in 40 years ever seen a type 1 in the neck in the cervical region, ever. Nor have I ever seen it reported. Now, it could be because these, these embryos die. That's one possibility. And the other possibility is that the timing is the issue. The early ones uh, uh, in the cervical region occur in day 19, day 20. That's long before the Mellings cells appear. And therefore, they're completely formed before these meningeal cells can join the midline tract, perhaps. But in the later ones, which are the lumbar region, lower thoracic region, are much, much further and closer to day 29. And therefore, when they form that that midline and the mesenchymal tract, the Mellings cells are incorporated in the middle. And if that were the case, you will then see the Mellings cells joining the middle, forming, surrounding each of the, of the neurotubes, and also the one facing away from the neurotube would form bone. And that's why it's more likely for these lower ones, lower, lower malformations to have a type one formation. This is type one bone spike, double, meningeal sacs, type 1 double meningeal. When you open it up, you can see the two sacs 
This is now sliding a bone out. This is after the bone is gone, you can see the empty dura sleeve. And when you open it up, you will see two hemicords. That bone, that cleft with the forceps are the dura sleeve in the middle that you left behind. And then, of course, there are bands holding, tethering the hemicords to the midline sep fibrous septum. And afterward, this is the fibrous septum. And after you remove it, you will have a hole in the middle. You can see in this case that the anterior spinal artery is actually divided into two. And this is the midline septum, and there's typical. Now, if you look at our own series of, we have, a, at that time when we incorporated, this is almost 10 years old now, 89 cases of type 1. And if you look at, look at linear regression of the age of the appearance of problems, you can see that clearly the Pearson coefficient is almost 0 0.8 that this is a bad disease. In other words, you wait long enough, they develop problems, They're typically very high likelihood of deterioration in type one. So clearly these things need to be dealt with. Now, what, what about type two? Type two is not innocent, even though when you look at it, it doesn't have a bone spike in the middle, it doesn't have two dural tubes, and this is what happens basically. Now, what happens is that typically there's a high incidence of type two in cervical lesions and upper thoracic lesions. Here's, I think, why. It is early, therefore the meningeal cells are excluded from the midline, and therefore what's left behind is not meningeal cells, therefore there are no double sac, just a single sac, but midline, in the middle, there's still mesenchyme cells retaining from the initial and the mesenchymal tract that can form fibrous bands, and those fibrous bands are what tethering your hemicords. Here's the case. This is a typical type 2, as you can see. In, in the old days, it used to be called dipromyelia, and people thought that, well, you don't see a bone spike. It's innocent. You don't have to operate on these patients. Well, in, that, in this particular case, patient deteriorated. You can see a fibrous band holding the hemicords, holding to the dura. And if you pull up on the fibrous band, you can see how the cord is tented up, clearly very tightly tethering the cord. And, and the operation is very simple. You just cut them and release the thing, and that's done. And again, if you do a, do a regression analysis, you can see type 2, 96 cases of type 2, and it is not at all innocent. You can see it's 0.6 Pearson coefficient. You can see the very, fairly high likelihood still of deterioration with age. So it should be explored. And we have seen double multiple splits. This is a case of a woman coming in 60 years old with a lumbar type 1 and a top of hair in the, in the neck and you can see, you can imagine type one in the lower region, type two split cord in the upper region where the hair growth is, you can see the two of them, so she has double. And the biggest I have ever seen are four of them in a single spinal cord. This is a quartet of split cords, the lar largest number I've ever seen. Four split cord malformations. you can see four spikes. This is no lie. So it's a weird entity, but it occurs multiple tracks. Now, so what happens to the mesenchyme cells, you can see it, it can develop mesodermal cells, cartilage, bone, fibroblasts, angioblasts, all of, all of the above, and we've seen elements in all of them. For example, this one has cartilage, cartilage. This one has got a big blood vessels in the middle of that cartilage, and you can see actual ABMs crawling in and out of that midline gap in these patients. And this one, smooth muscles, there you go. There's striated muscles, actually. You can see the midline septum on a type 2. And if you histologically look at them, there are clusters of muscle cells sitting in the middle and the blood vessels. And even fat, of course. This is a lipoma sitting in the middle midline cleft. This is not the kind of lipoma that you see in other type. It doesn't actually go into the spinal cord. It actually sits on the spinal cord. You can lift it up very easily, but it's fat deposit within the midline cleft. What about endoderm? Now, this is actually a, the rarest type of remnants, derivatives, but is in many, many ways the most deadly, the most lethal type of malformation. I'll show you why. You can imagine that because one end of the endomysacral tract is endoderm, therefore any of the endodermal cells can occur anywhere. And we have found neuroenteric cysts, which is remnants of endoderm, in, before, in front of the, the vertebral body, within the spinal cord cleft itself, even dorsal to the spinal cord attached to the skin. Let's look at some of these results. This is a, a story I love to tell. This is a 76-year Italian man who came to me in the early 90s when we were just doing, doing things. What he did was he was 
all, all his life he was normal, but except for one thing, he had a little hole in the back that keeps leading, leaking fluid all his life. Nobody ever told him why, but he was actually fighting in the Second World War in the Italian army and fighting against us. And in fact, he said that every, new, every day at noon, he had to change his tunic because it was soaked in this clear fluid. And he didn't know why, but he never had a problem. Finished the war, came to Pittsburgh, and emigrated to America. And one day, he slipped in the snow, and he became paralyzed in one leg at 76 years of age. So I saw him, and this is, this is his hole. And inside the hole, he's got this spike and inside the spike, you can see that he had a type 1 split cord malformation that was never known. But here's the fun part. At that time, I thought we're just going to go in and cut the bone. But here's the bone. Here's the hemicord. After we lifted the bone out, there's this little thing here. That little thing is attached. Sorry. It's attached to the, to the midline septum, but a separate entity and that turns out to be a neuroenteric cyst. It has cilia, as you can see. It has these goblet cells which produce mucin. Both are hallmarks of endodermal origin. He had a genuine endodermal cyst. Now, we've found since any types of thing. We can even find small guts, mucosa, sitting in the middle in the neuroenteric cyst. And certainly, muci carmine producing mucin, goblet cells, are plenty of them in neuroenteric cyst. So endoderm occurs. Now, this is in our frog. And in some of the frogs, we actually found a neuroenteric cyst in the middle. You can see the frog hemicord. In the middle, there's this big blob. That blob is, in fact, an endodermal cyst, very similar to the human neuroenteric cyst. So what about the second condition, which is persistence of the endomesenchymal tract? What if, in the majority of the time, the endomesenchymal tract disappears in some extent, but in some people, it completely retains itself? What happens? Well, this is one case where the upper part, the cutaneous part, the ectodermal part, persists, goes all the way down to the midline cleft, and is attached to the vertebral body in the front. Let's look at this. This is, presumably, it can happen that there can be a hole leading into a dermal sinus tract which goes into the midline bone, midline cleft. There's a child here. Type 2 split cord, a very clear fibrous median septum, a small hemicord on one side, a bigger hemicord on the other side, and this thick extra blob. We initially thought that extra blob was a neuroenteric cyst until we did this exploration through that lower hole in the skin, and it goes all the way down, and that's what we found. We found a ball of dermoid cyst attached to, you see that string attaching to the midline turf that goes plunge in the middle. There's the ball, there's the attachment, it's midline cleft, midline cleft, and right there. So clearly, this is persistence of the outer tract, and that can be bad. What about other predictions? What about prediction of the inner tract? Now, if you have this, if this diagram is correct, there should be cases where the ectoderm and endoderm are kissing each other in the same median cleft, right? If this is theoretically correct. Let's look at this thing. This is a 50-some-year-old scientist who was actually from NASA. He was an aeronautic scientist, very, very intelligent man. And he, all his life, he would be jogging because one leg, one, I think his left leg, was always the one that is weaker, but he wanted to conquer it because he, like, he conquered everything else, so he jogs every day. And then one day he slipped and he couldn't get up again. And that's when he, first MRI he ever had. This is a bloody thing. He's got about 14 PhDs. And this is his first MRI he had with his left, with his weak leg. And he's got this funny looking thing. He's got a blob here, of one of the hemicords, and he's got some extra balls. There's the type one split cord, as you can see up there, bony septum, lipoma in one of the hemicords, in the left hemicord, and the right hemicord doesn't have a lipoma, but if you look in between, that neuroenteric cyst in it. So exploration, you can see a left hemicord with distended with lipoma, right hand you caught looking pretty good, lifting up these neuroenteric cysts in between. But the best part is when you rotate the big hemicord, you can see two blobs on top. You can see one neuroenteric cyst, one dermoid kissing each other in the same median cleft. Look at this. This one has got mucin, which is the neuroenteric cyst. 
The other one has got hair and cheese, which is the dermoid, and the cheese right there, and the, the mucin and the cheese are literally kissing each other in the same median cleft. So it is true that you can have multiple things inside that median cleft in these things. And we just took out the lipoma. And this is afterwards. Now, what about persistence of the ventral tract? Now, this is very treacherous because ventral tract means that this is not something you open up and you can see. You have to explore and find it. And if you don't explore and find it, you'll miss it. This is a patient with a type 2, which initially we opened up. We saw two hemicords. We didn't see any septum dorsally. We thought nothing until we lifted it up and we saw a big thing right here. And you can see a fibrous septum in the midline and a blood vessel. And that is what's tethering. Looking back at the MRI, you can see the ventral septum quite nicely. And if you don't explore, you won't find, you don't, you don't treat this patient. This is a case where the entire tract from dorsal to ventral is completely preserved right through the, the, the midline cleft from the skin to, in fact, we just just a couple of days ago, we did a case at Great Ormond Street where there is a complete preservation of the tract from the, from the skin all the way to the front. And look at this one. This one has got, has got a median cleft dorsally. You can see the fibrous septum through the midline in the median cleft, and it goes eventually a stand to the defect in the, through the body of the vertebral body. So these things, again, if you look for it, this is another ventral tract that goes through a defect in the bone. So these things you have to look for. And in fact, in our 185 cases, we have close to 34% had ventral tethering. So if you don't look for them, you don't find them, and the patient's not treated. So always, always recommend um, exploration. Now, what about persistent the ventral tract causing other syndromes associated with split cord that, you, that the general surgeon would tell you they have seen? First of all, this is the spectacular one. What if that, that track continues to be hung, hung up, it's attached to the spinal cord and pull out the diverticulum in the intestine? Look at this patient. Look at this case. Now, this is a three-year-old girl born with a small right arm and a thoracic split cord malformation attached to the duodenum through a midline tract through the chest. Now, the part of the duodenum was operated on by a general surgeon later, early on at two years of age, detached the tract from the duodenum and took out the diverticulum in the gut. But what he didn't do was detach the thoracic neuroenteric cyst, which is still there. This is afterwards came to me because of this thing, but neurologically she was doing fine, she was doing everything, so we watched her for one year, and this is the residual Resurgent there and checks is in the check attached to a split cord as you can see right here Now a year later she came in almost dead with acute respiratory distress couldn't breathe because of tracheal obstruction Here's what happens the neuroenteric cyst in the chest expanded about five or six times you can imagine Right there huge and what happens you can still see the split cord here right here and what happens is that at the time of expansion, it pressed, you can see, this is the myelogram we did. You can see the cord here split into two. The anterior hemicord, posterior hemicord, the anterior hemicord actually goes out onto the mediastinum, as you can see here, and that one is attached to the neuroenteric cyst, which is here. There's the anterior hemicord, anterior hemicord gone out into the mediastinum. And in this particular case, the the neurotexis the, the has got so big that it compresses in the trachea and almost killed her. So we operated, of course, did a median stenotomy, very easily deflected the anomaly artery, collapsed the right lung, and there's the top of the dome, and we stuck out the drum, drained the cyst, and excised as much skin as we can, but unfortunately, it's attached so many things, attached to the heart, pericardium, we couldn't take it all out, so we left it, and fortunately, so far, this is decompressed, and the patient is doing well. But I suspect that sometime this may come back to bite us. So it, associated large injections can be very deadly. And then there is intestinal malrotation, which is another association with general surgeon would see. They call it the lats band, you know, in the old days. A lats band is this, this track. This is our famous endomesenchymal tract that was not detached 
and is attached to the second part of the duodenum, it prevents rotation. This is normal rotation, clockwise rotation, um, axial against the vital and duct, small bowel, large bowel. With the rotation, the large bowel is now surrounding the small bowel, framing it, hence the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, small bowel in the middle. That's normal. What happens if this is attached to the endomesenchymal tract, prevents this process of ro rotation, therefore, the proximal gut, it would be on the right side, the left would be a large gut, which unchanged from the embryonic form without rotation. So what happens is that this is a kid about that has an anterior posterior split again. There's the midline septum. It goes all the way out through the anterior body. Again, anterior posterior split. Anterior body had a neuroenteric cyst here. That's all the way down following the band. The band across to the second part of the duodenum, causing partial obstruction, but all the large bowels, as you can see, is all here. Right, small bowels here, malrotation with intestinal obstruction because of persistence of the endomesenchymal tract. So again, now the last bit I will talk about is the third condition which has to be fulfilled and what happens to the interaction between the hemicord and the heminosal cord. Now, we know that, we know these are facts. We know that in order for, for the neural plate to dorsally fold to, be, to, to finish primary neurulation, it has to have something called a median hinge point. The median hinge point is nothing more than a bunch of cells which are triangular in shape with basal nuclei, which then forces this into sort of triangular shape, produces a hinge point where the muscles on the side push the hemiplate up, it will form dorsally, come together like this. <coughs> and formation of these median hinge point cells, so M cells, are dependent on sonic hedgehog, which you've heard today. The hedgehog is produced by the nodal cord, and it diffuses across this gap, goes to the midline, forms these M cells, forms the median hinge point, therefore predicts and, and forces the neurulation to go upwards. What happens if you have a problem with the nodal cord being displaced away from the median hinge point, therefore it won't form a median hinge point, therefore the thing doesn't neurally. Now, here's what happens. What if the, the initial endomesenchymal tract, instead of being midline, is diagonal? Diagonal. Well, it's diagonal means that one side of the hemicord is now separated from the heminosal cord, and therefore the distance is so large that the sonic hedgehog cannot diffuse on this side, but diffuses across this side. You will have then one hemicord completely formed, the other one remains open like the myelom lingocele, what is then called a hemi-myelom lingocele in a split cord malformation in association with a diagonal midline structure. Now let's look at this child. This is a kid um, we did, again, fairly early on, we did a complete repair of an ONTD. We thought it was just an ordinary myeloma nigocil, except that about a year later, gradually, his right leg becomes more and more paralyzed. The left leg continues to do well. So we thought maybe something is wrong. So we did a scan, and we found this, which we didn't know. We found this is the first scan the kid had. Had a type 1 split, split cord, a bony septum, this is the repair, initial repair site, and during the repair site, the pathological thing, and, and you look at this, this is, this, is the, this is the oblique septum. You can see the hemicords. You can see one hemicord, the other hemicord. This is the one that we repaired thinking that that was the whole case. But because of the septum, we never saw the other hemicord, which is completely formed. We thought that was the whole spinal cord of the patient. We repaired it, there's the repair site. And in fact, what we are repairing is a hemi myelomingocele, and it is the, the oblique septum, as you can see. And of course, when we opened up this time, second time round, we found the split cord, the initial septum with a sort of cartilaginous fibrous thing. We pulled it out, and we now see two hemi cords. So you can see that how these things can happen. It's very rare, but believe me. So we suggest that every single time, lesson learned, all ONTD patients must obtain a total rexus before they go home. 
And so I would conclude it's sort of various things. So double quad malformations are well, we've seen it, and uh, quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pang. That was a really remarkable lecture, but I think in the interest of time, we won't ask any questions for that. We'll move on to the next.